Hello everyone, welcome to MSP lecture series on advanced transmetallic chemistry. This is 19th lecture in the series. In my previous lecture, I discussed about uh, the application of molecular orbital theory to main group elements with uh, a couple of interesting molecules where there are controversies when you compare valence bond theory or VSCPR theory. Now let us continue from where I had stopped. Now let us try to use molecular orbital theory or one can also call it as ligand field theory uh, to explain bonding among coordination compounds. And so I have just shown a generic MO diagram that depicts bonding in case of metal complexes with ligands having pure sigma bonding properties. A typical MO diagram can be written in this fashion. I am just uh, overwriting on the diagram I have shown to make you familiar with drawing yourself MO diagrams for complexes. For example, in this case what we are considering for any given transition metal n d orbitals and n plus 1 s and n plus 1 p orbitals are considered as valence orbitals and the intention is to utilize them uh, for making bonds when the ligands are entering coordination sphere. Now uh, here of course uh, to begin with we are considering atomic orbitals of uh, metal here we are considering this 5 d orbitals and we are considering n plus 1 s orbital and then we are also considering n plus 1 3 p orbital for which the Mulliken symbol is T 1 u and here we are considering ligand group orbitals. There are 6 ligand group orbitals are there and each one is coming with a pair of electrons. So, we have a total of 12 electrons that has to be accommodated. Let us not worry how many electrons we have in the d orbitals of transfer metals that is immaterial now. So, now if the 12 electrons are coming from uh, 6 ligands as 6 pairs they will be put here so now you can see uh, this is how this molecular orbital that have combined ligand orbitals along with two d orbitals that is in this case it is a dx square minus y square and dz square to generate this many bonding molecular orbitals in which this 6 pair of electrons are accommodated. If any electrons are left in T2G that is dxy, dyz and dzx they remain non-bonding and they are placed here. And now this gap what we have here here so this one so this is called delta O here and then from here onwards if you consider they are all anti-bonding properties they have their anti-bonding molecular orbits e g star a 1 g star and t 1 nu star. So, this is how one can write a typical MO diagram for a metal complex with octahedral geometry. Of course, this the same MO diagram what I showed is also good for ligands having only pure sigma donor properties. So, again I have shown here this is the same what I showed here except for the fact that I have also included the symmetry of the ligand group orbitals that so that you can match appropriately with appropriate metal orbitals to generate molecular orbitals A 1 G this A 1 G is coming here along with A 1 G is this one and then when you go for T 1 u so 3 orbitals coming here and 3 orbitals are coming here and then T 2 G E g is there E g 2 electron two orbitals are coming here and then e g two orbits from this d group will be coming here and then this will remain and this is t 2 g. So, rest would be same. Once you know how to write this diagram you should be able to fill the electrons according to the number of electrons you have in a given metal complex. So, this molecular orbit diagram represents ligands having only pure sigma donor properties. Now, let us look into ligands having both sigma donor and pi donor properties. So, in this case already told you in my previous lecture ligands have low energy filled sigma orbitals and low energy filled pi orbitals when they interact with metal atomic orbitals to generate molecular orbitals this gap between 
T 2 G and E G or T 2 and E shrinks, this is what exactly happens in case of metal uh, chlorides and fluorides. Okay. So, here relatively these compounds are uh, less stable compared to uh, pure sigma donor ligands. Then the other ligand group we are talking about is bonding with sigma donor and phi acceptor ligands such as carbon monoxide, triphenyl phosphine, and hydrocyclic carbenes and etc. In this one, here it is again metal valence orbitals n d n plus 1 s and n plus 1 p and here we have again ligand orbitals they are low energy filled sigma orbitals and high energy empty pi orbitals. So, in this case you can see the magnitude of uh, this separation has increased remarkably that explains why these complexes are very stable compared to other two class of ligands that I had described. For comparison I have put all the three types of you know di diagrams here, you can clearly distinctly you can see the separation between these two and of course, he in this case we also use the term HOMO and LUMO, this is highest occupied molecular orbital and this is lowest unoccupied molecular orbital between which electronic transition takes place. Once again 6 sigma donor uh, ligands such as water or ammonia and they are again coming with uh, 12 electrons, the, these are the yeah, symmetry of the ligand group orbitals that are going to combine with uh, metal orbitals and here I have just put 6 electrons in d orbital and these 6 electrons remain here as non-bonding and if there is any electronic transition is there these electrons can be promoted to this uh, higher energy state here. Okay. So, this represents a typical hexamine metal complex or hexa aqua metal complex here. Okay. Here you can put whatever the electrons uh, you think the metal possess after required oxygen state is achieved with that metal. So, this one you can guess what uh, geometry it represents and of course, the moment you see here two orbitals and the symmetry corresponds to A1 and T2 obviously this is for a tetrahedral complex. In tetrahedral complex we are talking about 4 ligands coming with 8 electrons and here we have 5 d orbitals again and here the symmetry will be E and T2 and as usual n plus 1 s orbit having A1 and this n plus 1 p will be having T2 in case of tetrahedral. So, here very similar to crystal field theory the energy of uh, E will be lower compared to energy of T2 and this remains non-bonding here and in many cases what happens tetrahedral complexes also have electrons in the anti-bonding orbital here. If they have more than 4 electrons obviously the fifth electron has to be placed here and these compounds are relatively unstable compared to octahedral complexes also to an extent square planar complexes. 4 pairs of electrons coming from the ligands would occupy these 3 plus 1 4 molecular orbitals here and electrons present in the d orbitals will be filled in this one if it is more than 4 uh, 2 electrons then it would go here usually here pairing does not start here because this gap is much smaller. So, electrons will be promoted here and they will be usually high spin complexes. Okay. And also I am showing you the orbits involved in this one, you can see these are the orbits having this kind of orientation, of course you can also compare them to Px, Py and Pz and this is A and all of them participating tetrahedral geometry can be seen here. Uh, this is called symmetry adapted linear combination of atomic orbitals, you can see here this is composer of dz square and dx minus y square you can clearly see and also you can see how dx minus y square orbitals are uh, oriented with respect to direction of approach of ligand again once again crystal field theory whatever we discuss it can be seen here why the energy of these things are lower and then if you see here again it is very clear why the energy of T2 is higher because they are almost uh, coming on the way of ligand approach here in all these cases. 
and this is the ML bonding molecular orbitals filled with the 8 electrons for 4 uh, ML sigma bonds and then we call them as antibonding molecular orbitals and this is how uh, the looks like antibonding orbital. The another one of course you can see here this is for square planar complex. In case of square planar complex again 4 ligands are coming but they are having different uh, symmetry or molecular symbols depending upon what kind of orbitals that are available for bonding from metal ion or metal atom. So, here uh, ND will be further split into uh, different sets that I should show you and then A1G does not uh, change here and since one of the orbital is participating in mixing and others two does not. If you recall uh, valence bond theory of DSP2, so one P will be mixing as a result what happens it, it has uh, two different type of uh, uh, P orbitals here. Then accordingly they are further split of course tetragonal elongation if you remember how it splits one can uh, visualize here also in case of ligand field theory. Then these are the molecular symbols given for uh, uh, various d orbital a1g, b1g for dx minus y square and b2g for xy and dxz and dyz still degenerate they are called eg set. And their metal to ligand bonding orbitals again 8 electrons are uh, comfortably placed here as 4 pairs and uh, they are responsible for making 4 metal to ligand bonds and they are anti bonding and, and these are non bonding orbitals here. This is very very important when we talk about reactivity and let us now compare bonding in metal carbonyls and metal phosphines. Uh, if you see metal carbonyl in my previous lecture I showed you about the lone pair present on carbon that is responsible to uh, perform as a sigma donor these electrons from CO would be overlapping with one of the orbitals from M essentially dz square or dx minus y square to form a sigma bond then the filled metal orbitals will overlap with pi star atomic orbitals to pi star orbitals of carbon monoxide to take electrons from the metal through back bonding and this is how carbonyl ligands stabilize metals in their low valent state in their low valent state and overcome interelectronic repulsion in the metal by taking comfortably the electrons from uh, metal to pi star of carbon monoxide orbitals. So, this is a typical metal carbonyl bonding scheme here and let us assume a pair of electrons are coming from uh, carbon monoxide these two electrons here this orbital and they interact with appropriate metal orbital to form a sigma bond. So, we established a metal to carbonyl sigma bond. Now, the energy of uh, this one quite comparable with uh, pi star of this one that is T 2 G I would say and then they uh, overlap they interact again to generate a set of bonding and anti bonding molecular orbitals. One thing one should remember here is pi star is not going to take directly electrons from the metal T 2 G orbitals. When the metal atom or an ion is ready for giving electrons from its T 2 G, T 2 G orbitals should be treated as atomic orbitals and pi star or anti bonding orbitals present on carbon monoxide should be treated as atomic orbital they to combine together to generate again a set of bonding orbital and anti bonding orbital to the bonding orbital what happens the metal electrons goes. So, this is how back bonding takes place if somebody says that sigma star or pi star in phosphines or carbon monoxide directly take electrons that is incorrect they are not going to take they have to be treated as atomic orbital and the T2G orbits are with pi symmetry are essentially T2G or DXY, DYZ and DXZ they have to be treated as again atomic orbital they combine together to generate a set of bonding and anti bonding orbital and they have pi symmetry and we call it as that is the reason we call it as pi back bonding. 
So, same thing I have shown here for in case of phosphorus, again phosphorus lone pair is there that goes to metal to form a sigma bond and then the sigma star when we write PR3 molecular orbitals, PR3 has a sigma star that sigma star interacts with uh, filled d orbital to take electrons and this is called back bonding here. Again in this case also sigma star orbitals uh, you should treat as atomic orbitals they interact with filled d orbitals to generate a set of bonding and anti bonding again they have pi symmetry and here electrons will be transferred from metal to this bonding molecular orbital and hence we call it as pi bonding very similar here except for the fact that here we are using pi star anti bonding orbitals and here we are using sigma star as anti bonding orbitals and then you can see symmetry pi star and pi so electrons would be transferred to this place so that what happens inter electron repulsion is minimized. So now I have shown here for chromium hexacarbonyl you can see here 6 carbon monoxides are there and uh, the symmetry is referred to A1G, T1U and EG here and as usual they combine here and then we I have also given T2, T2G pi star orbital as I mentioned these orbits are now combined with uh, T2G and you can see now this is a bonding and it is anti bonding and the electrons are placed here. And now you can say the moment it is involved in bonding the energy of electrons present here previously it was non bonding somewhere here it is lowered. So, since it is lowered the gap is increased so we can say now the compound the complex is more stabilized because the energy of this one is lower. You can see here this is the pair I have shown here this is the one uh, so that I am considering from 6 carbon monoxide this 6 pairs of these electrons are given shown here and then this pi star whatever I have shown here this is the pi star I am referring to here this is same as this one. So I have an interesting case here nickel tetracarbonyl and normally you do not see MO diagram for nickel tetracarbonyl. Here I have written too many electrons you may be surprised to see why I have written so many electrons instead of writing just 8 electrons from 4 carbon monoxide they are making bond with Ni to form NiCO4. But I have written extra electrons here you can see 1, 2, 3, 4 pairs are there and 4 and 8 pairs and another. So basically I have 16 pairs are there so that means about 32 electrons I have considered here 32 electrons where they are coming from yes let, let me show you here let me write Lewis dot structure again you know how we are establishing a triple bond between carbon and oxygen. So, this pair is 1, 2, 3 and 4 pairs are there, 4 pairs means 8 electrons are there and 8 electrons into 4 ligands 32 electrons are there. Out of 32 electrons what happens this 4, 8 electrons ok this 4 pairs means 8 electrons equals 4 pairs they are responsible for making bond. So, this is what valence bond theory says but is it really true let us examine that one whether the sigma the electrons really participate and interact with appropriate metal orbitals to make NiCO bonds. You can see here these 4 pairs are I am referring to this one this is the 4 pairs I am showing and then here 8 pairs whatever I am showing here these are the uh, electrons I am showing here together they remain non bonding and to our surprise if you see these 4 orbital should have interacted with this one as well as this one to generate a set of 4 molecular orbitals to place these 8 electrons very similar to what we saw in the tetrahedral complex in earlier case but if you see these 4 pairs of electrons remains almost non bonding here the energy is much lower compared to any of the metal orbitals here that indicates there is no sigma bond at all between nickel and carbon monoxide there is no sigma bond in order to have sigma bond we should have pulled these orbitals much lower and to connect with this one but that is not happening. So that indicates 
the fluorescent 4p energy are too high to interact with this sigma electrons from carbon monoxide. Then in that case there is no 4 sigma bonds at all in NiCO4. Then how NiCO4 is formed? NiCO4 is formed through only back bonding. You can see here pi star of carbon monoxide that is interacting with here T2, E, T1, T2 here and as a result what happens? The electrons here degenerate prior to the formation NiCO4 are split into two levels as usual E and T2 and the electrons are placed here 10 electrons present in nickel. Nickel 0 means 3D84 is 2, 0 means 10 electrons, these 10 electrons are placed here. That means just by splitting this one what happens? This is stabilized. So, valence bond theory says that we are utilizing these orbitals from metal to establish NiCO4 that is not the case at all. And of course, this one can see uh, if they want to read more about that one you can refer to these papers and uh, not many textbooks talk about this one. And I have not come across in many textbooks describing a more diagram for NiCO4 in this fashion, but this is very true and also this explains why NiCO4 is highly volatile and more reactive. For the same reason this is stabilized by only back bonding and there is no sigma bonding in NiCO4 at all. Whereas in case of chromium hexacarbonyl we have sigma bond that I showed you in previous slide. So there it is a solid and reasonably stable high melting point white powder moderately or reasonably stable atmosphere whereas this one is highly volatile and it can decompose readily. So, some of these properties can be explained nicely and, and bonding also can be explained and that normally we do not see in case of valence bond theory and also a crystal field theory of course, it does not explain anything about such complexes where metal is in zero valent state. Let me stop here and uh, continue more interesting uh, stories about uh, transmetal elements in my next lecture.